Thank you so much. Thank you, Daniel. Daniel's been such a blessing to us this year. He graduated from the School of Ministry last year and has given his time this entire year to our healing discipleship program. Just a tremendous blessing. Amen? Man, aren't you glad to be here today? Hallelujah. I am, and I'm so excited to bring this message to you today that the Lord has laid on my heart. We've had a, a few weeks here that have just been incredible, haven't we? Man, last week with Campus Days, Andrew Womack speaking for our 13th birthday, that was really special. And then the response that happened from our um, guests that were here, man, we had, I think, Donna, didn't you say 770 people were here for healing now last week? And a tremendous ministry, lots and lots of people received healings. And then uh, next week, Jerry Garcia is going to be with us. And for all of you who heard the woo, it's because they've heard Jerry before. How many of you have not personally been in a meeting with Jerry Garcia? Oh, wow. Okay. So you guys, uh, those of you who have been with Jerry, you need to say to the people who haven't yet, get ready. Amen. Amen. Because it's going to be awesome. But every week is just special. You know, how God has orchestrated this year and, and uh, just our speakers and our time together, it's really been incredible. And I want to thank Donna Jones for her role in our uh, Healing Discipleship Program as well as Healing Now. She's been a tremendous blessing to us. Amen. And Isabella uh, Kulovich. And also, yeah, amen. And also all of our interns, we've just had a tremendous team this year, and we've been able to reach further and go deeper than we ever have before because of the great leadership that God has brought to us. So you guys, thank you so much. But in praying about what to share today, uh, the title of my talk today is, What Does Prayer Have to Do With Healing? <laughs> what does prayer got to, you know, it's like, what, what's love got to do with it? Anybody write a song? called, you know, anyway, what's prayer got to do with healing? And I, as I was praying about it, that's what I heard. What's prayer got to do with healing? So did you know that Jesus never prayed for somebody to be healed? Yes. Never, not one time. And yet only one time in the book of James, are we told to pray over the sick and the Lord will raise the sick person up. So is there a conflict? Are we to command healing or are we to pray for healing? Did James tell us to do something that even Jesus didn't do? What place does prayer have in a healing ministry? So let's take a look at what the Bible teaches because, and let the Holy Spirit teach us from, directly from the Word of God. Amen? Amen? Hallelujah. John 14, 12 is where Jesus makes an amazing statement that we're all familiar with here. And here it is. Most assuredly, I say to you that he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also, and greater works than these will he do. Why? Because I go to my Father. What an incredible verse. So as we think about the works of Jesus, what we think of typically, at least this is how I've thought, is Acts 10.38, which says that Jesus went about doing good, and what? healing all that were oppressed by the devil. Amen? So Jesus healed people. He delivered people. Lives were transformed by the ministry of Jesus. We know that, right? So we know that we can do the same things that Jesus did according to this verse. But here's what I want to ask you today. How did Jesus do what he did? How did he do it? We know he was born of God and as Andrew said yesterday in our Healing Discipleship program, in him was all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. But we also know, and we learned this so beautifully from Chad Gonzalez when Chad was here, that Jesus was living out his life as a man on the earth anointed by the Holy Ghost. But because he was anointed, let me ask you, did he just go about doing whatever seemed right to him? I'm anointed, bless God, and I'm going to do whatever I want to do. Did Jesus go about doing that? No. Or was there something else going on here that maybe we haven't valued like we should? Listen to what Jesus said. John chapter 5, 
verses 19 and 20. Most assuredly, I say to you, the son can do what? Nothing. Nothing of himself. Even though he's the son of God, he can do nothing of himself but what he sees the father do. For whatever the father does, the son also does in like manner. Uh Aha. Okay. For the father loves the son and shows him all things that he himself does. And he will show him greater works than these that you may marvel. How many know that the best is yet to come? As good as it is and as much as we've seen, there's more. Tell somebody next to you, there's more. So how did Jesus see and how did Jesus hear what the father was doing? When did he see and when did he hear? I believe it was during his times of prayer. Have you ever wished you could have heard Jesus pray? (laughs) Man, I have. You know what? Jesus prayed in a way that so challenged the disciples that when the disciples heard Jesus actually pray, they said, Lord, you got to teach us how to pray. Luke 11, 1. Now it came to pass as he was praying in a certain place when he stopped or when he ceased that one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray. (laughs) I love that. You know what? Effective prayer will always avail much. The disciples heard something and they wanted what they heard. Hearing Jesus pray created a desire with them for more. Notice how, by the way, notice how disciples are people that are teachable. The disciples heard Jesus pray and what did they want? They wanted more. Disciples are people that are teachable. They have a desire to grow and to advance. And so just hearing Jesus pray made them realize there was more. Have you ever been there? Man, I don't know about you, but we moved at one point uh, in 2003 from um, Idaho to uh, back to Colorado Springs. And when we came to Colorado Springs, we became members of a certain church in town. And one of, uh, my wife went to one of the ladies' meetings uh, as soon as we were in town. And she was meeting with one of the leaders of this particular meeting. Her name was Eileen Redinger. And she began to pray. And Tracy said, the minute she opened her mouth and started to pray, I knew she knew God in a way that made me jealous. It started coming out of her heart in a way that even the words she said, but the way she said what she said challenged me to the point that I want to know God like she knows God. How many have been around people like that? Man, I remember uh, another example for me personally was being with a man named Wesley Tullus. I, I would listen to Wesley pray and not even for 60 seconds, this guy would be into his prayer life and I'd be like, oh my gosh, who are you? I want to know God like you know God. I had the privilege of leading worship for a series of meetings called The Secrets of Intercession with Dr. Billy Brim. And we traveled all over the United States doing prayer gatherings where uh, different leaders would pray and teach people how to pray. There was this lady who was in her 80s by the name of Rachel Tifateller. I'll never forget Rachel. I mean, when she would open up her mouth, it was like the Holy Ghost was in a dress. <laughs> Do you know what I'm saying? I mean, she knew God in a way that this made me want to get on my face. And I want to know God like you know God. Listen, this is what was happening with the disciples. They heard Jesus pray. And when they heard him pray, they were like, you got to teach us how to pray. Why? Because what they had been around was pharisaical. What they had seen was people blowing trumpets on the street corners and praying with a motivation to be seen by man. And then along comes Jesus. Wow. Prayer was super important to Jesus. And in fact, you know what? He invested hours into praying with the Father. So I want to ask you something. If prayer was that important to Jesus, why do we so often treat it like something to, quote, fit into our schedule? As Rick McFarlane would say, has it come to that? 
Do we have to pray as a joke? Luke 5, let's take a look at it, 12 through 16. And it happened that when Jesus was in a certain city, and behold, a man who was full of leprosy, he didn't just have, you know, a hand that was leprosy uh, infected. This man was full of leprosy. He saw Jesus, he fell on his face, and he implored employed Jesus, Jesus saying, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Then Jesus put out his hand and touched him saying, I am willing, be cleansed. By the way, you know what? Don't ever wonder if the Lord is willing to heal you. He's not only willing, he's already accomplished what needed to be done on your behalf. Amen? He said, I am willing, be cleansed. Immediately, the leprosy left him. Notice immediately, Jesus didn't contract leprosy. I don't know what happened during COVID. I, I don't know why the body of Christ became the body of COVID. How on earth did we get so afraid that if we came in contact with COVID, we would be the ones getting the leprosy? we would be the ones getting the COVID. No, we're the ones that contain the power of God. We're the ones that contain the healing life of God. We're the ones that can come up against it and deliver the goods, as Daniel was just saying, from heaven to earth. What's already in us is alive and well. And Jesus immediately said, I am willing to be cleansed. And immediately the leprosy left this guy. Then watch this. He charged this man to tell nobody. <laughs> but he said, go and show yourself to the priests and make an offering for your cleansing as a testimony to them, just as Moses commanded. And there's a whole backstory to that as to why Jesus actually told this man that. But, however, the report went around concerning him, concerning Jesus, all the more. And this could be a great marketing strategy, by the way. Right? Don't tell anybody about healing now. <laughs> Don't tell anybody about healing discipleship. And the report went around Karis all the more. Right. right? And great multitudes came together to, notice this, to hear and to be healed. Right. To hear, faith comes by and hearing by the word of God. Great multitudes responded as a result, came to hear and to be healed by him of their sicknesses or of their infirmities. Now, verse 16 is what I want to get to here. So Jesus himself often withdrew into the wilderness and prayed. What did Jesus do after a successful, amazing time of ministry? He withdrew to pray. Wow. Wow. What do you do? I got to tell you, I, I, I've been, been in a lot of ministry situations over my 50 years of ministry, but I haven't always withdrawn to pray. I've withdrawn to eat. <laughs> Bless the Lord and all that is within me. <laughs> right? I, I've withdrawn to watch a little TV or do a little internet surfing or withdrawn to do a little, you know what I'm talking about. I just got to get away and, and, you know, I got to get away and refresh. I got to get away and replenish. Whew, thank you, Jesus. That's done. What did, what did Jesus do? He withdrew to pray. Wow. Look at, look at Luke 6, 12. Now it came to pass in those days that when Jesus went out to the mountain to pray, he continued all night in prayer to God. Not only did he pray, but he invested time in prayer. So after praying all night long, verse 13 goes on to say, and when it was day, he called his disciples to himself and from them, from this group of disciples, bigger group, he chose 12 whom he named apostles. Notice how a major decision required major prayer. Then in Luke 18, verse 1, we read this. Then he spoke a parable to them that men always ought to pray and not lose heart. 
Oh, that's interesting. Well, could it be that we're losing heart today because of losing our prayer life? I want to propose something to you today. If we're going to do the same works that Jesus did, why don't we start with our prayer life? We think about healing and deliverance and all the other stuff, you know? Well, listen, that followed what was a major priority in Jesus' life. If we're going to do what Jesus did, let's start by modeling his prayer life. Amen? If we're going to do the same works that Jesus did, I believe we need to start with our prayer life. What would happen if we started to pray like Jesus? This was how Jesus did what he did. He saw it, he heard it first during his times of prayer, and then he did it. He didn't just do something and then ask God to bless it. It was already blessed because he did what he saw and he did what he heard. He didn't wait until he was with the people and then pray. <laughs> God, I have no clue what to do. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord, for just showing me right now. No, Jesus always went into a situation knowing that he had already seen and he had already heard. Why was he able to do what he did without calling a major prayer meeting? Why didn't he call the prayer chain? Get a thousand people agreeing with him, especially when he met the demoniac. I mean, come on, people. How many deliverance services have you had where you had a thousand demons in one guy? I'm just saying. I would have called everybody I knew. Make ourselves powerful in the Holy Ghost, bless God. You know, you know, it's amazing to us sometimes when we actually see God do what God does and we think, wow, it's because of my prayer time, it's because of my, you know, this, it's because of my that. No, you know, it's amazing. Let me not get ahead of myself here because I've got so much I want to share. But it's just incredible to me how we think the healing comes from us. We think we're the source of the healing if we have prayed, or if we have spent time in the Word of God, or if we've done, you know, something that we would consider kingdom-oriented. But we've got to remember that Jesus is the one who's the healer. Jesus is the one always who is the answer, no matter what the question is. Amen? So Jesus didn't wait until he was with the people and then prayed. He prayed first, and then he ministered. But as a result, he was able to be led by the Spirit of God, and do what the Father said to do, and that's all he did, and do what he saw the Father do. Now, Jesus said, if you've seen me, what? You've seen the Father. Could someone say, if you've seen me, you've seen Jesus? What, what's your life like? Amen? What, what are you reflecting? But... We know Jesus prayed for himself to be in line with the Father, right? But did he pray for other people? Yeah, actually, he, yes, he did. Wait, 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 wait. Daniel, I thought you just said that Jesus never prayed for anybody to be healed. I did. But I didn't say he didn't pray for others. Look at this, Matthew 19, 13. Then little children were brought to him that he might put his hands on them and pray. Who wanted to rebuke Jesus because of that? The disciples. Yeah. But what was Jesus' heart? After praying and only doing what the Father said to do and what, the, what he saw the Father do, what did Jesus do? He wanted to lay his hands on another generation and bless them into their destiny. I'm telling you, it's time for fathers to rise up in this generation. It's time for mothers to to be able to come with a heart that's full of God and be able to unload what God's already shown you and already said. Luke 9, 28, 29. It came to pass after eight days and after these sayings that he took Peter, James, and John and went up on the mountain to pray. 
And as he prayed, notice he's, he's doing it, but he's taking three of his closest friends, three of his disciples with him. And as he prayed, the appearance of his face was altered. Glory to God. Ladies, what could happen if you began to have a real prayer life? Can you say facelift? <laughs> Those of you who are afraid of aging, you know, the jowls are starting to get a little longer and, you know, uh, what, what would happen if we began to pray like Jesus prayed? It says here, the appearance of his face was altered. I'm just messing with you. But listen to this. And his robe became white and glistening. Now, that, I find that interesting. That his what? His robe became white and glistening. What did the woman with the issue of blood want to touch? The power of God that was in Jesus was so alive that it went into his clothing. What was on him began to be transformed because of what was in him. It all started coming through his life of communion and fellowship with the one who he knew loved him. John 17, 9, Jesus said, I pray for them. I do not pray for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. I pray for them. So you know what? He ever lives to make intercession. And Jesus prayed for Peter that his faith wouldn't fail. Listen, yes, Jesus prays for us. But notice not ever one time do we ever see Jesus praying for somebody to be healed. Now, I want to go back to John 14, 12 again for a moment. But this time, I want to finish the thought with a couple of the next connected verses. Okay? Again, John 14, 12. Most assuredly, I say to you that he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also. And greater works than these will he do, because I go to my Father. And whatever you ask in my name, that I will do. So that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. Now, here's what's very interesting, and we need to learn from this. Nowhere in the New Testament do we see an example of a Christian asking God to bring healing or deliverance in Jesus' name. It's simply not a biblical model. So why is this? Jesus told us to do it. I can't tell you how many healing meetings we've turned into a prayer meeting. He didn't tell us to ask God to do it. Why? Because God's already done it. Jesus already told us that as the Father has sent him, so Jesus is sending us. We've already been given power and authority over all the works of the enemy. So you know what? We don't need to ask for what we already have. Would you say that with me today? Let's personalize it. I don't have to ask for what I already have. I'm going to say it again. Let's say it together. I don't have to ask for what I already have. If I know I already have it, why would I be asking for it? Doesn't even make sense, does it? When Peter and John met the lame man at the gate beautiful in Acts chapter 3 and verse 6, he said, silver and gold I do not have, but what I, what? What I do have, I give to you. In the name of Jesus, not the name of Peter, not your name, but in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. I can't tell you how many believers would have gathered a prayer meeting right there at the gate beautiful. Come on, everybody, let's pray and agree. I believe we need to stop asking God to do what God is asking us to do. Did you hear me? I believe we need to stop asking God to do what God is asking us to do. Okay, point well made, Daniel, but we still have James 5. To talk about. We're told to pray for the sick. So what do we do about that? 
Well, first of all, it's the only place in Scripture where we find prayer for healing. Okay, well, let's take a look at it. I think it's one of those areas we don't need to ignore, but we need to find out what the Word actually says. So, James chapter 5, and we're going to begin with verse 13 through 18. You ready? You doing okay? You're so quiet today. You're listening intently. I can see it on your faces. Is anyone among you suffering? What's the, what's the answer? Let him pray. Wow, what a deal. So you know what? If you're, if you're going through something difficult, what should you do personally? Pray. If you're suffering, what do you do? Pray. Pray and pray and pray and pray and pray. Keep praying. Don't stop praying. Pray without ceasing. In everything give thanks, for this is the will of man. I mean, we could go on and on and on about prayer and how important prayer is. But he says, if anybody is suffering, what, 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 what should we do? We should be praying. Praying like Jesus did. Is anybody cheerful? Let him sing psalms. Have you ever sung your prayers? Do you know what psalms are? I love singing my prayers. I started doing it years ago, and I started laughing so hard, I got myself into revival over it. <laughs> I'm like, what is happening right now? I, I mean, I just, out of my heart, I just began to make melody, and pretty soon I was just singing praise, but my praise turned into prayer, and it all began to mingle together into communion with God. Are any of you merry? Go ahead and just sing some psalms. Is anybody sick? Oh, here we go. Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord and the prayer of faith. Everybody say prayer of faith. Prayer of faith. And the prayer of faith will save the sick or heal the sick. The word is sozo. And the, word will raise him, the Lord will raise him up. And by the way, if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. What an interesting sentence to put in with this passage of praying for the sick. The effective fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Then he goes on to say, Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. He was powerful, by the way. Do you know that? Elijah worked in miracles. I mean, all kinds of supernatural stuff happened through Elijah. But what does James say? He was a man just like you. He was a man with a nature just like you. But he prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. And then he prayed again, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth produced its fruit. How do we usually hear this when we're reading this James passage? Here's what I believe we usually hear. We usually hear this as a request for God to heal. God, would you heal this sick person? No. No. Instead of hearing it as the demonstration of the healing power already within the believer. Prayer here in this passage isn't just prayer. It's a prayer of faith. This is not a request. This is a prayer that boldly declares the known will of God. We're not asking God to do what he's already done. Healing is already a finished work. We are receiving what God has already provided. We can literally help people with this. And God is looking for leaders who will pray out the will of God on the earth today. I believe I'm looking at several people right now that are answering this call. Amen? Amen. Remember during the ministry of Jesus on the earth, I know this is kind of like a, as, as the kids would say, a duh, <laughs> but during the ministry of Jesus on the earth, the church did not exist yet. Okay? There were no elders in the church yet. 
There were leaders, but there weren't elders in the church yet. Jesus had to die and resurrect first to establish the church, which is also called the body of what? The body of Christ. So as the body of Christ in the earth today, every one of us have been called to heal the sick. This is not just for elders. This is for every believer. Amen. Mark chapter 16, verse 18. And these signs will follow those who are elders. These signs will follow those who are the five-fold ministry offices who stand on stages and have healing ministries. These signs will follow those who believe. Am I looking at some believers? Amen. Every one of us have been called as believers into a healing ministry. Amen. We are all called to lay our hands on the sick and see them recover. But what about somebody who can't come to the gathering together of the believers that we would refer to as I went to church? What about somebody who's so sick they can't come to the meeting or they can't gather together? Well, God's provided a way to help them. The sick person is the one who has to make the call, make the request, which is an act of faith and humility on the part of the sick person. What usually happens in today's world is we expect the pastor to make the call on the sick. We expect the leader to somehow know that somebody in the congregation is sick and oh, by the way, leader, if you were really filled with compassion, you would call them and go visit them. This is not what James 5 says. James 5 says it's up to the person who is sick to demonstrate the faith to call for the elder of the church to come to them and do what? Pray the prayer of faith. You guys okay? Okay. That sick person makes the call and calls for who? The elders, the leaders with a personal prayer life who know how to pray. They have a prayer life. They're not just stepping into prayer for the first time. No. If you look at the qualifications of an elder out of 1 Timothy, you begin to see this is somebody who's walking in godliness. This is somebody who's got a culture here of cultivating a relationship with God. They're doing what Jesus did. But what do the elders pray here? Oh, God, if it be thy will. That sounded like Mr. Ed. For those of you who are old enough, the rest of you just Google it. If it be thy will, Wilbur. Oh, my goodness. How many prayers have we prayed through the years if it be thy will. You know why? Because we didn't know. We literally did not know what the will of God was, so we tacked on that phrase. No. The elders here are called to anoint with oil and do what? Pray the prayer of faith. They pray what the word says, and then they say. They pray and they say. This is what God wants us to do. He wants us to pray and then say, do what the Father's doing. Say what the Father's saying. See, this is what Jesus did. He came into a ministry situation already loaded with direction from God himself. Tell your neighbor you're loaded. They speak forth, these elders, they declare, and they quote, command healing into the sick. Remember, Hebrews 11.1 1 says that faith is what? The substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things seen. So if you're going to pray a prayer of faith, what are you going to pray? Well, faith receives what grace has already provided. We're not asking God to do something he hasn't done. We're coming into agreement with a finished work. And we're declaring that over the person who made the call that couldn't make it to the meeting. So prayer here is not begging God. 
It's a prayer that declares the will of God and partners with God on behalf of the person who's being ministered to. Notice they're praying for the sick. Are they? No, let's take a look at it again. James chapter 5. Look at verse 13. Is anybody suffering? Let him pray. Is anybody cheerful? Let him sing psalms. Is anybody sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray what? Let them pray what? I can't hear you. Let them pray over him. Okay, well, that's, what's the big deal? Well, what I see here is if these people are probably bedridden. How many of you have been to a hospital to pray for somebody? Or a nursing home, you know, um, a situation like that, right? You've been in those situations where that person could not get out of that bed even if they wanted to, right? Well, this is what we're seeing here. They're praying over the sick, implying that they are most likely bedridden. They're told to pray the prayer of faith, and the prayer of faith will heal the sick, and the Lord will raise the sick person up. Jesus is always the healer, not us. But what we see here is people helping other people win. I love that. You know, when someone's in the hospital... There may be situations where a family member calls, and that's, that's fine, you know, when someone's in a situation. But when that person himself makes that call and says, I want the prayer of faith prayed over me now. The Bible says, let me refer to it again. The prayer of faith might... Heal the sick if you say the right words. If you hold your tongue just right. If you sound really powerful. No. It says, let them pray over the sick, anointing them with oil in the name of the Lord, and the prayer of faith will what? Will save the sick. And the Lord will raise him up. You know what? We as the body of Christ here are responding in compassion and leaders in the church are doing what Jesus did. We're here for each other. We're here uh, with each other. And everybody has a place at the table. There's nobody in the body of Christ that's a wart. (laughs) Oh, wow. Can't believe that just came out of my mouth. Everybody person in the body of Christ has value. There's nobody that's expendable. I heard a leader one time say about somebody who was a challenge in the congregation, Ooh, I just got to pray them out of here. I'm sorry. Why are you a leader? Who called you? The whole reason we're here, as Daniel was just saying earlier, is for people, Right? God's called us in the ministry not to make you look good, but so that you can help equip the body of Christ. Amen? So that we can come alongside and and do what Jesus did. So what's happened to much of the body of Christ is that we have such a lack of understanding that we're asking God to do what God told us to do, and then we're blaming him because he didn't do it when we don't see it working. You know what? The enemy has accused God and the enemy who is the accuser accuses us and he loves it when we have a lack of knowledge in any area, but especially this area of healing. And he, misrep- and he loves it when we misrepresent who God really is and what God has commanded us to do. Sadly, there's been more sympathy prayers being offered for the sick instead of actually praying the prayer of faith. Let me just prepare you for your funeral. Oh, bless your heart. I'm so sorry. Do you want a wood casket or do you want?
Be careful where you go to church. It might be a matter of life and death. Be careful what you believe. This or what a well-meaning family member says is going to be wisdom. Listen, we need to gain a better understanding of prayer, what it is and how there are different kinds of prayer and they all work together. I don't have time to go into that today. You know, from scripture, there's many different kinds of prayer, prayer of agreement, prayer of intercession, prayer of consecration. But when it comes to praying for the sick, we're not commanded to pray anything else except the prayer of faith. It's not our words. It's the prayer of faith that raises up the sick, according to James 5. So the main thing we need to be is people of prayer and stop allowing the enemy to distract us or get us so busy doing ministry (laughs) or life that we don't think we have time for prayer. Remember, it's the effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man that avails much. And when the writer here gives this example in James 5 of how a righteous man can avail much. Well, who's a righteous man? A righteous man is somebody who's in Christ. If you've got a relationship with God through Jesus, your prayer life can make a difference, not only in you, but in somebody else. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man will avail much. To the point that when Elijah prayed, it didn't rain for three and a half years. Pretty powerful. Amen? So don't wait to get into the meeting to have a prayer meeting. Have your prayer meeting in your prayer closet. Matthew 6, 6. Shut the door to the distractions. There might be some nights when you're praying all night long, but you know what's going to happen? As we start having a greater prayer life, I believe we're going to start seeing greater manifestations of the power of God. Why? Because we're going to start cooperating with what heaven is saying and what heaven is doing. We're not just going to come in our name and ask God to bless our thing. Make sense? If I can take a moment here, uh, Donna, I, I would like to have a couple microphones or at least a microphone and maybe a runner. And I want to open this up quickly just for some Q&A. Do you guys have any questions for me on this today? Is there anything that's unclear about this that I can help uh, clear up a little bit? Anybody? And if you, if you don't, that's okay. But I just felt led to give you a minute to ask some questions. This is a big topic. It's a topic where there's been a lot of confusion for a long, long time. Amen. All right. Yeah, when it says to uh, pray the prayer of faith, is that a certain prayer or what is the prayer of faith? Right. Great question. What is the prayer of faith? And again, we could take a whole teaching to talk about that. But basically praying the prayer of faith is praying the word of God. What does the word of God actually say? You know, uh, the only way we can move, uh, Daniel mentioned earlier that whatever is not of faith is actually sin. We could say whatever is not of faith is unbelief. So the prayer of faith is always going to be praying in agreement with the word of God and saying what God says. Make sense? So we've got power through the prayer of faith to be able to actually help other people come up out of wherever they are. And many times people think that a prayer of faith is just praying something that's heartfelt. So if you've been around church life for any number of years, you know, when someone's sick, we try to be really understanding and sympathetic and, you know, pray with compassion. And what that means for us is that we don't really expect healing we just want to come alongside of them and, and almost like um, hospice. We want to just help them feel better, right? I, I hope it all turns out for you, and I'm so sorry. Now, we never see Jesus modeling that or any of the disciples modeling that. What they modeled was just the opposite. They did what the Word of God said, and there's where we find the power. Hope that helps. Thank you for asking that.
Yeah, one more here, right here. Oil. Yeah. And also in Mark, it talks about how the disciples cast out demons, anointed many with oil, and healed the sick. Yeah. Is there a significance that we should understand about the heat, the anointing of oil? Yeah. Another great question. Thank you for asking that. Because again, uh, we we could do a whole in easily an hour teaching on uh, anointing and anointing oil. But I'll tell you just real quickly, anointing oil is simply a, a place of tangible contact. It's very much like communion. It's not the communion that actually heals you, but when we partake of the, of the juice or the wine and we partake of the bread, it's a place where we can identify with what's already a finished work. So it's not the elements themselves that bring the healing like some of the church believe, right? But it's simply a representation of a finished work. And this is what happens, happens with anointing oil. You know, anointing oil, it, it's like for me personally, and, and you can use anything. I mean, I've been in meetings where I use Crisco. <laughs> Nobody had anything, you know, but it's like olive oil, you know, it, it's not necessarily the oil in itself. But man, I tell you, I love when especially in today's world, when they have anointing oil that's actually um, like with frankincense and myrrh, it's got fragrance to it. And when someone touches you with that anointing oil, or I've been in meetings where they actually poured the anointing oil over you. It, ladies hate that because it ruins your hair, you know. But um, man, it smells so good. And the aroma of that anointing oil just is like a reminder of Jesus, you are so good. Thank you for that finished work. Thank you for the anointing that abides within me. And again, it's a point of contact. That's all it is. Anoint with oil to help that person be able to realize this is a finished work. And as a result, the prayer of faith is what actually raises them up. Amen? We have time for one more? Okay. necessarily mean that you have to uh, call Jesus' name or you can say in the name of the Father because in James 5, 14, it said, anointing him and with or in the name of the Lord. Yeah. So does it mean Jesus or the Holy Spirit? Yeah, that's a great question. Yes, in the name of Jesus. In fact, let me share a scripture with you really quickly out of Acts chapter 3. You know this. In fact, I was referring to the man at the gate, beautiful, when uh, Peter and John healed him. But I want to show you, if we can put this up on the screen real quick. Uh, this is Acts chapter 3 and verse 12. And um, the people now are kind of like in our modern vernacular, freaking out over the fact that they saw this guy who had been lame for all these years suddenly get up and he's healed. Like in, an, in a suddenly in an instant, right? And it says in verse 12, so when Peter saw the people running together here, he responded to the people and he said, men of Israel, why do you marvel at this? Or why do you look so intently at us as though by our own power or godliness, we had made this man walk? Now jump down to verse 16. And, and, uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I want to break out into tongues. And uh, verse 16, and his name, the name of Jesus, through faith in his name, has made this man strong, whom you see and know. Yes, the faith which comes through him, through Jesus, has given this man this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. So it's, the, it's always in the name of Jesus that we do what we do. Why? Because that's where our victory is. That's where the finished work is. But you know what? You can't just use the name of Jesus like, oh, it's probably a really bad analogy, but like hocus pocus. You know, like some kind of a magic phrase we just throw in, in the name of Jesus. No, it's faith in the name of Jesus. It's believing that finished work that again causes the accomplishment of the manifestation of the life of God. I believe we're going to start seeing greater and greater. You know why? Because we're not going to settle for what the church settled for years ago. Amen? We're contending and we're saying, Jesus, I want to do the same works that you've done, but I want it to begin with my prayer life. 
Transform me so that that transformation can come through me in the name of Jesus. Amen? Yes. Hallelujah. Has this been a blessing to you today? Yes. Praise the Lord. Why don't you stand to your feet? And I want to invite our healing disciples who are scheduled to minister through the laying on of hands to the front here. And again, we want to give you time to be able to personally be ministered to and receive more ministry. And thank God for the ability for the body of Christ to do this for each other. Man, you know what? I've used this example so many times, but um, the man who was lame that was on the stretcher, in, in, the, in fact, our song we started off with today was Tear Off the Roof. You know, when that guy was there, you know what? If the church had existed then, you know what that guy could have done? What do you think? He could have called for the elders. He could have called for the elders. But remember, the church didn't exist yet. So you know what he did do? He did a really smart thing. He reached out to four crazy friends. And he said, I want to get to Jesus, but I can't get there by myself. Can you help me? Amen. Amen. What was wrong with Moses? I mean, Moses, here's this powerful guy, you know, who's operating in the supernatural. But at one point, God says, I'm going to send two people to help you, Aaron and her. Okay, well, come on, Moses, you can do all things. What's wrong with you? Suck it up, buttercup. No, God never told Moses anything like that. Why? When Moses began to grow weary in well-doing, what did God do? Sent two people to hold up his hands. Listen, thank God for the body of Christ. If it weren't for the body of Christ, you might not even be here today. We are here to help each other. We're here for each other. And there is no condemnation when you want someone to agree with you, you want someone to pray the prayer of agreement, you want someone to pray the prayer of faith, you want someone to be able to lay hands on you and minister life to you, man, and you know what? You can do it as many times as you need to do it. Praise God. As I love what Rick McFarland says. He says, have somebody lay their jumper cables on you. <laughs> Amen. If your battery is growing weary and well-doing, Amen. Come on, let's lift up our hands and just pray right now. Father, thank you for the name of Jesus. Thank you for the power that is in the name of Jesus. Thank you for the word of God that is alive and powerful. And Lord, that you have already done what needed to be done for us to be able to walk in victory today. You have overcome and your overcoming life is our life. It's in you that we live and move and have our being. Father, we are so grateful for Jesus. We thank you for the power of your presence alive and well in us right now. God, we honor you. We glorify you. We magnify you above every other name. We declare that you are the Lord who is worthy. You are worthy of it all. And God, we give you thanks. We give you praise today in Jesus' name. Amen. Before we dismiss today, I want to just remind those of you joining us on the internet, in our call center, which is now open 24 hours a day, seven days a week, praise God, we've got people standing by right now that want to pray with you. Whatever it is you're going through, you don't have to go through it alone. Man, as I look into the camera right now, I, I see so many faces from all around the world and how grateful you are that we're able to live stream this Healing Now service on a weekly basis. Thank you for joining us. We're believing with you. We're standing with you that whatever it is you are believing God for, God is faithful. And you know what? He can do exceedingly above all you can ask or think according to the power that might show up someday. No, according to the power that's already working in you. Glory to God. God is not against you. God doesn't have a future plan for you that's full of sickness and disease. Man, he's got good things ahead for you. So don't let the enemy rip you off. Don't settle for second best, third best, fourth best. Man, let's just go for the whole enchilada. Amen? 
Let, let, let's just do what God said we can do in his name and see the kingdom of God established all around the world. How about that? Amen? Come on, can we give God a praise today? Just thank him. Glory to God. Thank you so much for coming today. We're going to be here again next week with Jerry Garcia. It's going to be powerful and invite some friends. But let me just pray for you real quick and dismiss you. And then all of you who are in discipleship, we'll see you in the next hour here in just a few minutes over in the Barn Auditorium. Those of you who are visiting us from the public today, thank you for coming. Thank you for being a part. We love you. And we always are so grateful for our time together. Amen. Amen. Father, thank you for your love for us. We bless you. We thank you for your goodness. And I just dismiss this gathering now in the power of the name of Jesus. And everybody said, amen. amen and amen. Those of you who want some further ministry, come out to the aisles and let our ushers direct you to our, our praying disciples, our healing disciples, and they'll be happy to minister a little further to you today in Jesus' name. Amen.